Hello, everyone. We're reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Chapter 9, The Midnight Duel. Harry has just ridden a broomstick for the first time and done quite well of it. And now it looks like he's in trouble with Professor McGonagall. They've just gone inside, walking behind her. Everything is very tense. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Fitwick, could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood, thought Harry, bewildered. Was Wood a cane she was going to use on him? But Wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of his class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said McGonagall, and they marched up, up on the corridor, Wood looking curiously at Harry. In here, Professor McGonagall pointed them inside a classroom that was empty except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out, cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said McGonagall crisply. The boy's a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be being expelled, and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught that thing after a fifty-foot dive, McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a seeker, too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Lie? Speedy? We'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor. A Nimbus 2000 or a clean sweep 7, I'd say. I shall speak to Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. Flatten in that last match by Slytherin. I couldn't look Snape in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. Later. You're joking! It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he'd left the grounds with McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said. But first years never! You must be the youngest house player in about... A century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry, only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the team, too. Beaters. Oh, I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we've got to go, said George. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passageway out of the school. I bet that it's one behind the statue of Gregory the Smarmy that we found in our first week. See ya. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up. Malfoy, flanked by Crab and Goyle. Having a last meal? Potter, when are you getting on the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now that you've got uh, back on the ground and you've got little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing at all little about Crab and Goyle, but the high table was full of teachers, so neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I'd take you on any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want. Wizard's duel. Wands only, no contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard's duel before, I suppose. Of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight all Ron. We'll meet you in the trophy room. That's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel? said Harry. And what do you mean you're my second? Well, 
A second's there to take over if you die, said Ron, casually getting started on his last cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, But people only die in proper duels. You know, with real wizards, the most human Malfoy will be able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away and punch him in the nose. Excuse me! They both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. Can't a person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. <laughs> Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the points you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught, and you're bound to be. It's really very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you call the perfect end to the day, Harry thought as he lay awake much later listening to Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all night giving him advice, such as, If he tries to curse you, you better dodge it because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filter Mrs. Norris, and Harry thought he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last. We'd better go. They pulled on their bathrobes, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched black shadows. They had almost reached the portrait hole when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger wearing a pink bathrobe and a frown. You, said Ron furiously, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Don't you care about Gryffindor, or do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the House Cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you. You just remember what I said when you're on the train home tomorrow. Not so, but what they were, they couldn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside and found herself an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit and Hermione was locked out of Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? she asked shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand out here and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth, that I was trying to stop you, and you can back me up. You've got some nerve, said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of snuffling. Mrs. Norris? Breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's big snout, but it won't help you now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madame Pomfreyman did it in about a minute. Good. Well, look, Neville, we've got to be somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody Baron's been paused twice already. Ron looked at his watch and then glanced furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I learn the curse of the bogeys, Quirrell told us about, and use it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, maybe to tell Ron how to use the curse of the bogeys, but Harry has to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along corridors striped with bars of moonlight from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a staircase to the third floor and tiptoed tip -toed toward the trophy room. Malfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy cases glimmered where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shield, plates, and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he's chickened out. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. 
Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak. It was Malfoy. Slip around, my sweet. They might be looking at a corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror struck, Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently toward the door, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped the corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. It was right, Harry mouthed to the others, and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery. Not looking back to see whether Filch was following, they swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another, Harry in the lead, without any idea where they were or where they were going. They ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurled through it, and came out near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. <sighs> I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double <laughs> and sputtering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you. You've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione, he said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought that he, she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of a classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves. Peeves, please. We'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. <laughs> Wandering around at midnight, ickle thirsties. Tap, tap, tap. Naughty, naughty, you'll get caughty. Not if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Should tell Finch I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed, down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives, right to the end of the corridor, where they slammed into a door, and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they put helplessly at the door. We're done for, this is the end. They could hear footsteps. Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora. The lock clicked, and the door swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they go, Peeves? It was saying, quick, tell me. Say please. Don't mess with me, Peeves. Now where did they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right, please. Nothing! <laughs> Told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. <laughs> and they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing away and Filch cursing in rage. <sighs> he thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville for Neville had been tucking on the sleeve of Harry's bathrobe for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room as he had supposed. They were in a corridor, the forbidden corridor on the third floor, and now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog. A dog that filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling mad eyes, three noses twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging slippery ropes from yellowish fang. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them. And Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken them by surprise. But it was quickly getting over that. There was no mistaking what those thunderous cries meant. Harry groped for the doorknob. Between Filch and Death, he'd take Filch. They fell backward. Uh, uh, Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else, because they didn't see him anywhere. 
but they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the porch of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you been? she asked, looking at their bathrobes hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. Pig snout! Pig snout! panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as though he'd never speak again. What do you think they're doing keeping a thing like that locked up in a school, said Ron, finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? She snapped. Didn't you see what it was standing on? The floor, Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could have all been killed, or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared at her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind. You think we dragged her along, did wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed into bed. That dog was guarding something. What did Hagrid say? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something you wanted to hide, except, perhaps, Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package from Vault 713 was. But that will have to wait until next time.